Good morning, everyone. I thank God for this opportunity that God has given me to share the word of God with you. I had not dreamt to be a pastor. I just thought I'm pastor's wife and that is enough. And I thought that means was enough for me. But God was calling me again to, start, to stand on the pulpit and preach the word of God. And here I am. This morning, I will read two books. Uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 6, uh, verse 33 and 34. And then we'll go to Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. Let us start with Matthew, chapter 6, uh, verse 32 to 34. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let us read Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We'll read from verse 1 to 11. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried sharing myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with, with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made uh, reservoirs to water groves and flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more heads and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and this treasure and the treasure of the kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we honor you, we glorify you. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you have given us to be in your presence, Almighty Father. Even as you share your word, Lord, I pray for anointing upon me. Cause me to speak what you want your people to hear, Almighty Father. Use me as your vessel for your kingdom, for your glory, to build up the hearts of your people. 
Lord, thank you that you are in our midst to bless us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, I have entitled my message, Seek First the Kingdom of God. I remember last week, Pastor was preaching about us uh, valuing the church. And I was tempted uh, to entitle my message, Value the Kingdom of God. But I said, I will use this one. Seek first the Kingdom of God. What does seek mean? I just wanted to find the meaning of the word seek. And I just found out that seek is just to look for, to go after something, or to search for something, or to strive after something, or to aim at getting something. Now, when we talk about seeking first, uh, it means Whatever you seek, among the things that you are seeking, you put a priority, the first priority on something that among other things that you may be seeking, I want this first and the rest can follow. And most time uh, we hear people talking about maybe my family first, my, uh, my marriage first, my children first. We have so many things in this life, but we set priorities on the things that we put ahead of us. Uh, so in this passage that we have just read, especially in Matthew uh, chapter six, uh, Jesus was addressing what most people worry about in this life. As they were following him, he discovered people were worried about life, about what to clothe, about uh, what to eat, about their tomorrow, about all that things are done in this world, even as many of us do. Because we are worried about our lives. We want to see achievement in our lives. We want to eat well. We want to dress well. We want to invest for, for the future of our children. Now. After addressing all that, he told them how God knows the things that we need and how he is able to provide for us. But also, he told them how with our own strength and energy and abilities, we cannot acquire anything if God has not allowed it to come to us. And he just gave a lot of examples telling the people on how God can dress even the, the flowers in the fields, how God can feed the birds. He was just trying to make them not worry about this life. Now, in contrast of uh, worrying, he told them, uh, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. So, in relation to that subject, I have just decided to draw uh, the life of Solomon as an illustration of our everyday life and what we crave for and what we think we want to accomplish and what we want to achieve in this life and see if they are really beneficial in this world or not. King Solomon gives us a reflection of his own life how he spent most of his time, most of his resources, most of his wisdom, most of his knowledge and skills investing in this world, investing in this kingdom uh, because of the demands of this life. This life has a lot of demands. And at the end of his life, we see him realizing that the whole purpose of man's existence is not just the things around us. It is to fear God and keep his commandments. That is the purpose of man. That is what God wants in life. So I want us to learn uh, 
just two important lessons from these passages that we have read. Lesson number one, why should we seek first the kingdom of God? It's because the kingdom of God is eternal. The kingdom of God is eternal. Again, if we go uh, to Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 4 to 9, he says, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. About male, I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also, uh, I also owned more heads and flocks than anyone in this in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of the kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well and the delight of a man's heart. He's telling us how he worked hard to acquire what man's heart desires. Eh? He undertook projects, big projects, and he's telling us, he's trying to tell us, you know, sometimes, many times, we just say uh, Solomon was doing all that because he was crazy. No, he was a wise man. With his wisdom, he wanted to accumulate wealth. Yes, it was a promise of God. God had promised to bless him. But now, he paid all the attention on creating wealthy, accumulating, and he's saying, I had all this for myself. Hmm? But he did not know that this kingdom and its achievement is just temporary. Your life is temporary. No one had li has lived here on this world, uh, in this world forever. We have so many great men who lived in this world. And if you, everyone was uh, asked if we wanted these people to live forever, we would say yes, so and so live forever because they, they were great people, very beneficial in this world, but still they are no more. Even King David himself, whom God says he was a man after God's heart, still time came he had to leave this world. So this world is not our home. This life that we have in this world is just temporary. And if you know that this world is temporary, whatever you achieve in this world is temporary as well. So you find many people use a lot of time, a lot of resources, forgetting even to value the church we don't have time with God because we're just busy working to achieve and accomplish our goals in this life. I'm not saying to accomplish things that in this life is bad. It is good. But do we have time with the things of God? How many times you are supposed to pray, but you find from morning to evening, you are just working hard, you are just busy investing, you don't have even time to go before the Lord and pray. You don't have time even to read the word of God. Sometimes even on Sunday, people say, I want to open my shop. I remember some time back, my husband refused to wed a certain young man. Because this young man had a shop, and the shop, of course, was in the, uh, in the strategic area. Those days, shops were very few. So he used to supply for the needs of the people around in that community. And on Sundays, he could not come to church. And when we asked him, 
Why didn't you come to church? Oh, you know, on Sunday, that's where people come to buy things. In the Sunday is when people do shopping. So I don't get time. So all the time, he will come maybe just to show up and then he will sneak because pastor was tough on him. So sometimes he will just come. When the, the service is starting, he will come and sit in front so that pastor can see him. And then after a few minutes, he disappears. He goes to his shop. Then when we are about to close the service, again he will come. And you will see him in the church. Because you know those, time, those days, the services could go up to how many hours? Sometimes three hours. So at least he will be in church one hour. Two hours he is in his shop. But we noticed him that he is never in the church. So time came, he wanted to marry. And he said, now pastor, I want to marry. And the pastor said, yes. But during the time of his process for, for marriage, he could not also come to church. And the lady, the wife to be, was very committed member in the church. And she was the Sunday school teacher. All the time, she's in the church. So pastor said, I am not going to wed you. I am not going to give you my daughter because you'll close her in your shop. So I want to see you change. And those days, <laughs> it is not like these days, yeah? These days, you tell them, I want to wed you. They go to the court, they wed, and then they come. But he told the pastor, I promise I'm going to change. Give me a few months. And he said, How? he gave him a few months. He said, I want to see you in church for three months without missing. And the guy was in the church every Sunday. Because, only because he... But after the marriage, he disappeared for good. <laughs> but the reason was because he was accumulating. He was making money. He was achieving his goals. And that's what many of us do even today. So many people are busy with their works. Yes, we should be busy with our work. We should be busy with our businesses. But we need to know that this life and whatever we work for, whatever we work toward, is just temporary. There's another kingdom that we are going to live in forever. So here we see what... Uh, King Solomon is doing. He, has, he says, I liked this version. I undertook great projects. There are so many people who are undertaking great projects. There are so many people who are aiming to achieve great things in this life. Yes, no matter how you aim to achieve great things, no matter how many great projects you have, you need to remember that as I do my projects, I need to value the kingdom of God. I need to seek the kingdom of God. I need to balance my time. I need to balance my life with this life and the life in the kingdom of God. I was just counting at the projects he was doing, and I went one on one. He says, he built houses, not one house. Remember, he was a king. It was a palace. And in the palace, there's not one house only. And his project was, <laughs> when he was building his house, he used gold. He built houses, and the palace, his palace was full of gold. We are told in his palace, the whole house was coated with gold. Every article in the house was gold because he had accumulated gold. But also, he planted eh, vineyards. He had fields and fields of vineyards. Also, he had uh, a lot of pools to water the gardens. He had parks. 
and so many things. Those were projects that he planned to do. And he says with his own understanding, he wanted to achieve those things. He bought slaves to come and work for him. And there were many slaves that were born in his house. You know, you buy slaves, you keep them, in, they marry within the palace, they bear children, and the children become also the slaves. And if you read further, you find even Jeroboam was the son of the slave in his house, the son of the servant in his house. So he was busy, and it was not just accidentally, he had planned to accomplish all that project. But after accumulating all that, after doing all those projects, he looked at them, he said, yes, these are my projects. These are my works of my hands, and I must enjoy them. That's what he says, that, you know, the man is to enjoy the labor of your work. No one works for others to enjoy. Is there anyone who is just working for other people? I know, Pastor Abel, you have five children, and we are working every day. I am not very sure, and you have not told me, if we are working because for our children, we are working for ourselves, and we want to enjoy the labor of our hands. Every time I push him, we are building a house. Uh, we have a house, we thank God, we are building another one. We thought we have this project and we thought we want to enjoy life in this house. So every time I tell him, we need to finish this house. I want to live in this house when I'm still strong. <laughs> Why? Because I'm not building for my children. I'm building this house for myself and my husband. So I keep on telling him, when are we finishing now this house? When are we finishing? And for him, you know, he's a perfectionist. He wants everything to be done how he wants it to be done. For me, I just want to move to the house. <laughs> and the other time, when we were moving to the house we are in, I was telling you, know, when you travel, I am telling you, when you come, just come straight, because when you travel, you'll find me in that house. <laughs> because I could see the house is ready for me to enjoy, and he's telling me, oh, the roof is ugly, I have to demolish this and do this, or oh, we have to do what? We... <laughs> to enjoy. That's what King Solomon was saying. I did all that all my project for myself to enjoy, to enjoy the labor of my hands. That's what many people do. But if you read Ecclesiastes 2, verse 18 and 19, now he realizes that this life is too short to enjoy everything that you work for, he says. I hated, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun. Why? Listen, why? Because I must leave them to one who comes after me. Pause there first. You see now, he has wasted a lot of energy, time, resources, and everything. All his heart and mind was on these projects. Now, before he realizes he's holding, he knows you cannot live in this kingdom forever. You have to live because this kingdom is temporary. This world is just temporary. So he knows now he's about to go. He's 90. He's maybe 80 because he died when he was 94. So in his old age, he realizes, and now instead of enjoying, he says, I hated all the things I had toiled for under this sun, in this world, in this temporary world, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. Now, 
sad enough, verse 19. And who knows whether that person who comes here will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill and under the sun. This too is meaningless. You can pause there. What am I saying this morning? Some of us have the mentality of Solomon that we think maybe we are here to last forever and we sacrifice our relationship with God at the expense of what we want to accomplish, at the expense of our projects, at the expense of our career, at the expense of our businesses. But time is coming that we need to live and live everything in this world. And after all that, we thank God for him, at least he even realized and he repented. But some of us just die at work. There are people who just collapse at work. You just go before you are even prepared. Now he says, who knows? There are people who are working hard. I want when I die, I, I leave inheritance for my children. Let me tell you, who told you that your children want what you have now? We went to America the other time. And we were just touring in the city of New York. And we were told this, this, we went to a certain street. Can't you remember? But we went to a certain street where we were told all oh, these buildings have no people because their owners were rich people and they have died and their children are rich and they don't want to live in these houses. They have chosen to build the houses of their choice. You sacrifice your relationship with God simply because you want to build a house for your children. And who knows if they'll be wise to live even in that house. Sometimes at your funeral, they demolish the house and they want to do something else. I remember the time when my father-in-law died. Uh, it was a sad story. My father-in-law was the richest in his community. He was a great farmer and he had human resources like Solomon. Not like Solomon, but at least he had the spirit of Solomon. <laughs> You'll forgive me. Because while Solomon had 1,000 wives, my father-in-law got seven wives. Yes, seven. I'm reminded. Seven. I found six. Seven wives. I don't know how many children Solomon had, but my father-in-law had 30 plus children. And all those children were human capital. He used those people to finish his project, to accomplish his projects. And I remember those times when the government officials could come to a village to see great projects of the village, they could take them to his, to his farms. But you know what happened? The day he died, the day he died, all those children, I think they were not wise. Because, except him, and he was not there. <laughs> and he was not there. And his father kept saying, you need to keep at least some animals. Because uh, I, the story, I was told the story, I was not there when he died. My, my son Abel is not married. Keep some animals for him. So what they did after he died, they, they divided the iron sheets. Yes, the iron sheets on the roof. So everyone will go and, and pluck out the irons, 10 irons, because there are many people and they, you know, everything was not enough for them. So when I went, when I married my husband, I found, I don't know this word in Kiswa, in English, just like, I found just ruins. And I was like, what happened? 
And he's telling me, you know, when my father died, everybody took what they pleases. And I was just left with two goats. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh -huh, two goats and a bicycle. <laughs> so he tried to sell those to pay my dowry. He failed to get because my father also wanted more than two goats. That's why he tells you the story. He had to go to the mines to look for money to come and pay to my father. Who knows the people you want to live your wealth with if they're wise enough even to take care of them. So, it is my advice today. Balance your time. Do projects, but serve God. Love God. Go to church. Worship the Lord. Build your relationship with God. Because you don't know what you are going to leave behind. But Jesus said again in his story, he says, ah. He says, do not store up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin and destroy and where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also if you invest in the kingdom of God, if you invest much time in the kingdom of God, instead of accumulating, just accumulating for yourself, for your children, you better even give to the Lord. You better give to the needy. You better eat with other people and you get a reward in heaven. Lesson number two. In the kingdom of God, there is fulfillment. In the kingdom of God, there is satisfaction. In this life, you'll never be satisfied. No one has ever said, enough is enough. It is only the rich fool. The rich fool who said, now, enough is enough. I have everything. I can just build up many stores and keep everything for the rest of the year. And also he, was also, he knew the other years he had also to work. The demands of this life will never allow you to be satisfied. Never. No matter how billionaire you become, you want to be trillionaires. No matter how millionaire you become, you want to be billionaire. No matter how you have a house to live, you want the second house, you want the third house, you want the fifth house, you want the whole world to know you are the richest in that community. This heart, a human heart, is never, never satisfied. But in the kingdom of God, you find fulfillment. And that's why you find even those, the poorest people who are born again, who know God? They don't know even what to eat. They are happy, very happy, very satisfied because they know the Lord will provide. They have satisfaction in their God because they trust God is the provider. Now, the achievement in this kingdom will never, never satisfy your heart. True satisfaction is found in God alone. The meaning of life is not defined in what you possess. The meaning of life is found in our relationship with God. Life is defined on who we are in God. So, we see now Solomon had acquired all that he needed, yet he felt empty, very empty. And in Ecclesiastes 1, 14, he says, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. All of them are pointless. All of them are just nothing. 
and he calls it a chasing after wind. The more you chase, the more you have nothing. The more you chase, the more you have nothing. The more you chase, you just feel you have nothing. You need more, you need. It is just pointless. That's what he says. And this word, meaningless, appears 34 times in just one book. He repeats it and he repeats it to emphasize that the meaning of life is not defined in what we possess, in what we do. But what matters is our relationship with God. The pleasure of this world, too, cannot satisfy your heart, never. If you want to enjoy your life, go ask Solomon. If you feel like I want you to enjoy in this life, and he says, in these few days that God has given us, because we do not have the control of our lives. Who has the control of his life? Who can tell us how many years do you have? Awali, do you know the years you have in this world? Does your wife know how many years you are going to live in this world? That's why he says, these few days that we are given, in this life. Whatever you do, whatever you want to enjoy, it will not satisfy your life. He tried. <laughs> he tried. You know, I want to assure you this morning, possession, pleasure, power, position, whatever you can call, cannot satisfy your heart. I was looking at this man. He says, you know, now <laughs> he came to a point where he applied both wisdom and madness. He did foolish things. He did wise things. He did both for the sake of enjoyment. He just wanted to enjoy. So he did even foolish things. On the wisdom, he had power to command people to surrender to him. He had even other promises. Other kings were surrendering to him because of his wisdom, his leadership capabilities, because of his position. He was in command. I'm telling you this morning, even if they make you the king over this whole world, we will never be satisfied. People are craving for positions. They are ready to die. They are ready to compromise their faith. They are ready to bribe simply because they want positions. Now, even without compromising, without bribe, now you are de you de maybe they declare you you are the king of the entire world. What are you going to benefit? He says, man, all he needs is just to feed his stomach, and your stomach is just as tiny as it is. You need only one plate. Even if you are given the whole world's clothes, you cannot wear them all. You need maybe, if you want more, maybe 1,000. You just wear one per year. He says, you, they cannot satisfy you. He tried foolishness. What was the foolishness? He tried to marry every beautiful woman. As many of us do, we don't marry them and bring them in our houses, but you see the Nyumbandogo, it has even craved into the church. You find believers, their eyes, he says, I denied nothing my eyes desired. That's what he says in his reflection. Whatever his eyes saw and said, hey, that one. And he, was, he had power and authority. He said to say, I want this woman. I want you have a beautiful wife. If the king says, I want you to want you come to me, you know your wife will just follow the king. You will think he, she will stay with you. She will go to the king. Ah, I don't like this man. Oh. You know, find some reasons to the king. All oh, beautiful girls to the king. Now, whatever his eyes so undesired, he says, he denied no one. He denied nothing. Why? He wanted to enjoy. And he had this, what he calls harem. 
Her room was a campus, was an apartment. I don't know whether it's an apartment. It's a certain set apart place with building, a big hall. I was shocked. I thought he was marrying them, living with them in a palace. He put them somewhere and he could just visit and choose. He said, line up my wives, they line up. <laughs> Today I want that one. That one comes. That one goes. Other women were just the name, the wives. They never even came closer to him. But that also did not satisfy him. 700 wives. He said, no, they are not enough. He went to the concubines, the servants. You cook nicely. I love your food. You know those servants, eh? Sometimes you make yourself presentable to your boss. Says, come, come. Some of us do foolish things as well because we are not satisfied at home and we think maybe if we call women or men, it's not just the women, the men, even women. Oh, I'm not satisfied with my husband. You go with somebody else. Tomorrow you are not satisfied with somebody else. You go to another person. Before you realize, you die without being satisfied. You divorce a hundred times. Because nowadays, I don't think the life can allow us to marry all those women. What are you going to, 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 to feed them? Because if you look at his life, Solomon, every day, I was just looking at his daily provision. Just to give you an example, just one day he had to slaughter 10 cows, 100 goats, 100 sheep, gazelles, and all that, just for the family. So today, because life is, you know, because life is tough, what people do is, I'm not, I'm tired with this man. You marry another one. I'm tied with this woman. You marry another one. And because our court, you know, they just do what you want. You go to the court, they ask you, what do you want? We want to divorce. Then you go to the, to the commissioner, what do you want? We want to marry. So it's just divorce, marry, divorce, marry. But I am telling you, you will divorce, you will marry, but you never get satisfied. The only fulfillment you need in your life is found in God. And that's why I have made up my mind to live with my husband. No matter how weak he is, no matter how imperfect he is, I've made up my mind. If he does not fulfill me, I know the one who can fulfill me. If I cannot satisfy you, just bear with me. The Lord will fulfill you. The Lord will give you satisfaction. The Lord will calm your heart. So sometimes I don't even quarrel with my husband. I look at him and see he's just a man. A man. A human being. With differences. With all those things. Then I go to God. And when I pray to God. When I read his word, when I look at his promises, I'm full of satisfaction. And all I do is I go to him. I say, my husband, I love you. He doesn't know yesterday I was just down, down, down. The same to him, I'm sure. What am I saying today? Instead of investing much in these other things, plus these other things, Invest in God. Set your time. Set your priority in the things of God. And you will enjoy life. As I finish. I want you to do a reflection of your life. 
Meditate upon your life as a believer and put your life in a balance. Where are you investing more? What is consuming most of your time? Where are your priorities? Are your priorities in the things of this world? Are you giving the priority in the kingdom of God? Are you building your relationship with God? Or you are just, you are just in touch, in love with your projects? that you cannot even leave them. You are just in touch with your wealthy, with your accumulation. You cannot even give towards the Lord. You cannot even give towards the needy. You cannot even give uh, whenever God wants you. Sometimes even God speaks to us. I want this. I say, no, this is for me. I just want to challenge you this morning. Do a reflection of your life and see where you are. If you have balanced your time with this kingdom and the kingdom of God, ask God to continue helping you. But if you think this kingdom is taking much of your time, rededicate your life. Rededicate your life to Christ. Rededicate your commitment to God and start afresh with God so that we see that this life is just temporary. Whatever we accomplish in this life is just temporary. There's another life to come. In fact, his conclusion, he says, in Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14, he says, now, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. The whole purpose of mankind is to fear God to keep his commandment in whatever you do, in your everyday life, remember to fear God. Remember to keep his commandments. Remember, judgment is coming where all human beings, with all that we have invested in, will be judged according to our deeds. May God bless you.